name is Adrian Nanchev and this channel is all about championing hemp's use and bringing it into the mainstream conscience. So click on the subscribe button below and press the bell notification next to it for the latest uploads and join the movement because we want hemp. Now here are 10 facts about hemp. Firstly number one is that hemp, hemp as we know it or hemp or cannabis sativa was categorised in 17, uh, 1753 by Car Carolus Linnaeus, a Swedish botanist. He categorised it and shortly after that a Frenchman called Jean de Lamarck categorised and discovered quote unquote, cannabis indica and he named it after the Indian content. In 1924 a Russian uh, botanist called D. E. Janashevsky discovered cannabis ruderalis and it seems to be that every strain of hemp plant is like on a spectrum of these three in some fashion or another or every strain of cannabis every breed every kind of subcategory and subgenre is one of the or is like dominant or or submissive each of these in its in their own way number two is that um, cannabis and marijuana and hemp are completely different things there's big differences if anything hemp is hemp is really cannabis sativa and marijuana and cannabis uh, just cannabis indica because indica has a chemical inside it called THC that THC is a psychedelic uh, chemical that, that makes you go high essentially and that has generally speaking they're high in THC and they're low in another chemical called CBD whereas cannabis indica is the opposite low, uh, low in THC and high in CBD this low in THC is so low generally less than 0.3% uh, or 0.1% it's not enough to make you high it's so diluted or it's so weak it's just not enough but it's this THC that's found in hemp that does have lawmakers and the, and the legislative branch up in arms about the legalization of hemp and the cultivation of it for industrial uses number three is that uh, hemp can be turned into a variety of different kinds of products hemp, hemp or cannabis sativa can be turned into clothing can be turned into shampoo, it can also be turned into milk, it can be turned into cl um, car panels, there's a composite, it can be used in hempcrete for construction, we can use it in foods, we can use it in animal bedding, pharmaceuticals, even fuel as well. It has around 25,000 uses and possibly 100 plus thousand as a composite material. For example the car panel, certain car companies here in the UK use hemp in the car panels that it's in it's in the door it's just interior of the door uh, in in between them you know outside and interior it was in there and probably some even use it for dashboards and part of the plastic or you know the the, the part where the handbrake is and the gear stick that kind of like plastic covering over there but it has 25,000 uses as itself clothing bags shirts hats socks food there's a lot of essential fatty acids in it and a damn good ratio of protein omega 3 to I mean a damn good ratio of omega omega 3 and omega 6 almost near perfect as well as, I think it's 4 to 1 I'm not quite sure as well as uh, a natural source of protein so that's very interesting number 4 although initially actually number 4 hemp can actually be very difficult to process before 1919 a character called George Schlichtin had the patent for what is called a decorticator which made the processing and separating of the shiv from the fiver the stalk essentially of the hemp plant it made it very easy whereas prior to that the processing of hemp was very difficult and quite laborious and labor intensive however because the decorticator was more or less in, patented in 1919 the cotton ginny was created much before that I believe in 1900 or 1901 I can't quite remember and that gave cotton the advantage the distinct industrial advantage because prior to that both of them were arguably laborious in their own way but with the invention of the cotton gin or the cotton ginny I think it's the cotton gin it gave cotton the advantage so a 19 year gap was a little too little too late because by then it was either too expensive or too laborious to install, you know, buy and install the, the cordication material, uh, capital and machinery to make hemp much more industrial. And so I think we'll, we'll, this is, con there's some ideas going around that DuPont and Hearst, two big companies in America in the 1920s and early 30s, 
said, or not even 1919 said, it's too expensive to buy the decodicator, so they can either refit their entire organisation, which is expensive, or they could just get rid of the competition. Which leads me nicely into number, point number five, which is that um, initially banned, quote-unquote, in 1937, hemp was um, seen as, hemp was almost indistinguishable back then to marijuana and cannabis. They saw hemp the same thing, a psychedelic component that made, that their argument was made you go crazy, made you aggressive, made you made you insane, made you commit crimes. Very, uh, it was an inhibitor of crime in a way, and an, an assassin of youth. They they saw it as. So they created or Harry J. Anslinger, the drug czar, what is now called the DEA, in 1930, sought out to demonize hemp and cannabis in the, in the public in America. Initially, the local authority of the states weren't really on board with his demonization. So rather than, so in, very clever thing what he did, arguably. So rather than going for the legislator directly, he went for changing public opinion and affecting the voters. Because if the voters, if their opinion can be turned, and naturally, the legislators and the people they elect, they will be turned as well and be more anti cannabis, anti marijuana. So it's an interesting little thing there. And some would even say that Harry J. Anslinger only did this course, this course of action, because he needed to justify his job and his department. This is just after alcohol prohibition and in a, in a, in a depression era, America, he needed to justify, he needed to create an enemy, a boogeyman, for the American people to justify his job. So he, he demonized hemp and marijuana, which maybe that was in collusion with the big companies and corporations. Possibly, we, we should only really see. Probably, yeah, to be honest, looking at common sense. But number six, interesting point is that the law was revised in 1946, post-World War II, because they were now worried, possibly Harry as well, they were now worried that hemp and marijuana made people more lazy, more, much more subdued. So they were worried that the Russians and the Soviets would hijack marijuana and use it to subvert the American citizens so they'd be more lazy and less resistant to propaganda or to war or to things like that, less less resistant to the Russians. So they were worried about this and the interesting this is because in the 1980s the American government was also worried about Tetris, the game with the blocks. They were worried that Tetris would be used to subvert the American uh, citizens as well. So it's an interesting little pattern going off there where the Americans are maybe overreacting to certain things, or maybe justifiably reacting to certain things, and worrying that the Russians might hijack this and use it for their own advantage. But the point was, in 1946, they were then worried that hemp made you lazy. But nine years earlier, they were worried that it made you very active and aggressive. So their reason for concern went to complete, did a 180, which is interesting to know. Now, uh, point number seven. Now. Although the cultivation of hemp is not allowed in the USA, it is allowed in the Native American reservations in the Midwest because the Constitution doesn't really apply there. The, the federal government doesn't really apply there. So there is talk over the past few years that there could be a new gold rush or a green rush even with hemp cultivation in the Indian res in the reservations because they can grow it and they realize the potential for it. They have, they have the cutting edge almost in the 1980s with casinos and gambling, and now they're getting the cutting edge again with hemp cultivation and growing it. And if they do it, this is only talks, there's a company called um, Canon Native, which hopes to bring this into the Indian reservations. They hope to bring hemp, and if they just start growing hemp uh, domestically, then nothing is stopping domestic manufacturers and builders from buying the hemp from the reservations and just shipping it to different states within the state within America itself and using it there as opposed to importing hemp from abroad China and Canada and the UK as well so it's interesting to note that that there is Indian reservations Canna native they're, they're interested now number eight there are potentially a hundred plus chemicals inside cannabis and, and hemp the two main ingredients or the two two uh, chemicals are uh, cannabis um, are THC and CBD. THC, which is, as I, as I said, the, the psychedelic chemical, and CBD, which is much more calming and much more opposite, kind of balances out one another. 
There are also things like THCA and CBDA, which is an acid form. I, I believe it's when the main chemical is heated up and they become the acid form, or when the acid is heated, then it becomes the, you know, THCA goes into THC. But there's a few others like CBG and CBN, and, and uh, I believe it's CBG, it's like a stem cell, it's like the precursor to the acids, it's like the precursor one that becomes either one of those THC or CBD. But these are all, like, they're all the, 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 the minority, but the majority are T, T, THC and CBD. Now, number nine, there are different medicinal uses for cannabis and hemp. There's a certain strain of, um, of hemp or cannabis indica called Charlotte's Web that was featured in a 2013 CNN documentary by Sanjay Gupta. He was following the life of the Figi, Figi family that now living now reside in Colorado. See, their daughter, Charlotte Figgy, was having epilepsy, and they heard about how cannabis oil can treat epilepsy. So, these brothers that were in Colorado happened to have a certain strand of, of cannabis that was very low in THC, and I believe they also wanted high in CBD, because the CBD has anti-epileptic, epilepsy um, effects. So the whole documentary followed them from the very beginning to where they are today, with with regards to Charlotte's Web, and this is interesting with regards to all the medicinal and scientific evidence is coming out that this tide wave of information and knowledge and change and awareness will eventually lead to the legalization of domestic hemp cultivation as well as a removal out of class one substance in America. Because when it because as a class one substance, it's saying there's the federal government is saying there is no medicinal properties of cannabis, and yet we see from the evidence from the ground, Charlotte Figgy and her experience, as well as dozens of other people. If you're really interested, check out Rick Simpson, and I believe it's cureyourowncancer.com. Some very interesting, fascinating testimonies and case studies and research with regards to the medicinal purposes of, uh, medicinal uses of cannabis. Also, cannabis has some anti-inflammatory anti properties and uh, painkiller properties as well, analgesic effects. So right out the bat, right out the bat, this plant has a lot of potential, and because of a lot of potential, yet still legalized and still class one drug, you can kind of see why some people, bigger companies, big pharma, etc., might want it legalized purely because of competition, and you can't really, you can't at all, in fact, patent a plant. So there's there's natural competition to the status quo. So it's interesting research and interesting ideas. Now number ten is that inside us, we naturally have what is called the endocannabinoid system, ECS. This system is different um, receptors on the synapses in the brain, and different receptors throughout the body for the major organs, but most, most of them are in the brain. This system regulates and controls and influences things like mood and hunger. What's also interesting is that this system naturally creates our own THC and CBD, naturally. This is why people tend to get things like runner's high, because, I don't know, I'm not quite sure, there's, there's a the build or an excess of THC or, or very CBD of sorts inside the body. This is why some people tend to feel amazing after a run, may due to be a fact that there's naturally, arguably, naturally cannabis chemicals that are inside the body. But T, the ECS is a very interesting system to look into, endocannabinoid system. Also, number 11, because I like to go the extra mile, in 2015, in North Dakota, there was a house that was built out of hempcrete. I think it's called the, the Now House, N-A-U House, which is German for New House. Um, that was built using hempcrete, and more or less one of the first in the States, but built entirely of hempcrete. Now, I personally think hempcrete has a lot of potential in the future for construction, for dealing with uh, homelessness and dealing with the housing shortages, especially here in the UK. I believe that hempcrete, when you create more proper houses, it can change the dynamics of an economy. And hemp, very interesting property as well, when mixed, hemp shiv, which is the, the body of, of the stalk, when mixed with lime, creates hempcrete. There's also another version called hemp adobe, uh, but I believe they're roughly similar, probably, probably a little different chemical um, build-up. But hempcrete, it naturally sequesters carbon, meaning that as it uh, over time it absorbs carbon. I think one kilo, 
One cubic metre of hempcrete can absorb up to 154 kilograms of carbon over, the next, over a 10 year period. So that's a lot of potential to tackle, as some would argue, climate change and, or global warming. It's also interesting to note that because of the nature of lime, over time lime petrifies, so it dries, it, it, becomes, it turns into a rock. So over time the building actually gets stronger. So like clothing, interestingly, hemp doesn't wear out, it wears in, which is an interesting property of it. It's also worth understanding that hempcrete has an R value of 20, meaning that it's a very good insulation of heat in the winter and a good coolant in um, uh, summer, that's it. Uh, so it's, it has some very good it breathes, so it allows air in and out, and as well as very fire retardant or very fire resistant. It doesn't really burn. So some very interesting properties for um, for construction. So those are actually eleven facts about hemp because I like to go the extra mile. So if you have, if you haven't already even, click on the subscribe button below and press the bell notification next to it for the latest uploads and join the movement because we want hemp. How cool is that?